I want to invite everyone else to rise up again as you're able. This is the first time this morning playing this song, and it was an inspiration of the week with the idea that, you know, it's got that nice groove and it, the power that animates our body and animates our mind is that same power in these two hands and these two feet is that same power that can change the world. So I want to invite you just sway, get your hips a little sway, and maybe, you know how I like to play with my hands, maybe put up your hands a little bit, recognize the power of those hands. Cause I can change the world with my own two hands, make a better place. Oh, with my own two hands, make a kind of place, yes. Oh, with my own two hands, with my own, with my own two hands. With my own, with my own two hands. I can make peace on earth, yeah. Oh, with my own two hands, and I can clean up the earth. Oh, with my own two hands, and I can reach out for you. Oh, with my own two hands, with my own, with my own two hands. Oh, with my own, with my own two hands. I'm gonna make it a brighter place. I'm gonna make it a safer place. I'm gonna help the human race with my own, with my own two hands. Okay, so how many of you remember what the theme is for this month? Powerfully. Living powerfully. Thank you. Good, good, good. We're moving into divine power because we can. Now, I want to define that because when I did some research, I was looking up the word power and powerfully, and there was a bunch of definitions I didn't really care for. Um, but this one I do like. 
The ability to do something or act in a particular way. To me, that's um, like being able to be free, free to choose. Another way that I might look at that or bring it down for myself is that I'm no longer a victim of circumstance, but a victor of circumstance. Because stuff happens, even to spiritual people. Stuff happens. I mean, God doesn't say, oh, well, you're spiritual. I mean, what would that be? And like what spirituality would be? No. No. Uh, but it does, but what we do say is that we will always have the inner resources to move through something. So I had this wonderful opportunity for service to listen to a gentleman who's been in, the, in this community. Wow, he was here when I was going through ministerial school. So that was a long time ago. Let's just say like 35 years ago. And um, he, he shared, so I can say this because he shared it out in public, that he's been dealing with cancer for the last six and a half years. And two weeks ago, when we had our prayer service during, I'm not sure which service it was, but he s stood up and asked for healing prayer. That, and a lot of us really took the stand for spirit can do things through our body that we don't think we can do. Well, he, he wanted that prayer because he was told, well, he was going to have surgery for this cancer, like, let's just get rid of this thing. He was going to have surgery on, on uh, Tuesday, and all of the doctors, and he consulted about three different ones, said that it would be between four and a half and five and a half hours. And there was, you know, iffy probabilities. Well, it only took two and a half hours because it went so smoothly. No, the doctors were surprised. They found no cancer had moved outside of the organ that the cancer was in, so no periphery cancer. And this has been going on for six and a half years. No periphery cancer, none in the lymph nodes, nothing. In fact, they downgraded the type of cancer that he had. <laughs> now, the stuff happened. That stuff, that cancer was a stuff. How many of you have had stuff? We have stuff. One of the things that we have in common is that we're human beings and stuff happens. But what he did was he used that stuff to shift a lot of the way that he lived, and he also used us. He let that, that situation call forth a request from all of us for spiritual support. I think that when we allow ourselves to realize that we can be spiritual beings and have stuff happen, what we will do is we will let that stuff be stepping stones to even better stuff. <laughs> so what if you just use the stuff instead of an obstacle, you just said, whoa, I guess this is a lift up. That's what I want to talk about with power. I want to talk today about accessing our spiritual power. And I, I need to move back and just bring you all up to here, because we've been talking about this for a month. I want to just bring us all up to this present place and, and say something that I said uh, at the first of the month, which is that divine power, the power that we want to access, because if we're not accessing divine power, we're just being forceful. We're just trying to make something happen. We're just bah, muscling through. And the power that I'm sp speaking about will use us, lift us, and do more through us than we can do by ourselves. Now, divine power is the way that spirit is because it is synonymous with spirit. If we have a quality of spirit or what we think, I'll just throw out a word. How about God? If there's a word, if there's a word that we would use as an attribute of God, it is also synonymous with God. So when we speak of God, we're also speaking of power. We're speaking of all the things that we think God might have. And, and power is one of them. Now, why do I say that, that spirit is powerful? Because nature is the, the face of God. Nature is what shows up that we can see and observe, and nature is powerful. How many of you would agree that nature is powerful? Who, I mean, really, we either harness its power or we are abused by its power. And when, and when we go up against it like, oh, no, let's build little ticky-tacky houses on a fault. Let's see what happens. <laughs> the, the Incas were so much smarter than that. 
You know, what's so incredible about going to Peru is that all sorts of structures were built on top of the Inca temples and they just keep falling down every other year because they have an earthquake, things fall down and the Inca temples are still there because they decided to build knowing that nature was powerful, not hoping nothing would happen. And, and since we are spiritual beings, it's in our nature to be powerful. It's just who we are. It's our nature. We, oh, just back up a bit. How many of you would agree that you're spiritual beings? Great. You are spiritual beings and you've suited up in a human existence. And we should be strutting that stuff. Strutting our human experience. Because we're not our human experience unless we only identify with our human experience. And a lot of people do. We say we're spiritual beings, but we think we're lowly humans, or we act that way. Uh, there, was a, there was something that my, uh, uh, one of my first practitioners used to say, and he said, if it was against the law to be a spiritual being, would there be any evidence to prove you guilty? Think about that. Another way to say that is, are you living every day from the highest idea of yourself? Or are you living every day from the lowest idea of yourself? We're either identifying with our human condition or we're identifying with our, human, our spiritual reality. Now, um, I want to say a little bit about, about more about that because I've had the great opportunity to teach a class on metaphysical interpretation of the Bible to a bunch of great students. And it's really made me re-own, uh, re-enlist in this wonderful divine wisdom. Not from a literal point of view, not from uh, who cares who begot who, uh, not from trying to figure out how this could all ever possibly happen, such as, let's just do this. Just to prove I don't, I, I don't, I, I really love what, the, what comes through the Bible, but not necessarily in the way that it's expressed, such as Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. And then there were a bunch of grandkids. How'd that happen? <laughs> Just saying. Anyway. <laughs> so I'm not going to take this too literally. But I do believe in the metaphysical interpretation, you get back far enough and you see that through stories, people of, uh, that had allowed themselves to be filled with some sort of divine intelligence wanted to communicate that intelligence and they did it in a way that could speak to the people. But the people, they were storytellers. The Middle Eastern people are storytellers. They exaggerate. Feeding 5,000 didn't mean feeding 5,000. It meant a bunch of people showed up. That's what it meant. So it wasn't literal. Nobody was there with a little clicker. <laughs> Get out of a break. So I'm, I'm, re I'm looking at some things again and doing some research, and what I realized is that if we're talking about power, we're talking about being empowered. We're talking about being in power and power in us. And that was one of Jesus's, the master Jesus's prime objective was to empower the people around him. It was all about being empowered and the way that I know that is because he talked about the kingdom of heaven. And in the first three gospels, he mentions the kingdom of heaven at least 100 times. Now that's a lot. That's a theme. And kingdom was something that the people at that time could understand and would understand because they were used to kingdoms. There was the Roman kingdom. There was, all, there was always a kingdom. No, there was no suburbs. You lived in a kingdom. You were ruled. They were used to being ruled. They were used to being told what to do. Hopefully, the person telling them liked them so that it was somewhat beneficial, 
but it was still always under rule. So he comes along and says, I, I, I have a kingdom I want to tell you about. And the kingdom, if I broke it down, oh, there's so much I want to tell you about this. First of all, it was queendom, because the word in the Aramaic is feminine. Excuse me. <laughs> snap, snap. <laughs> but of course, that didn't go over well when it was interpreted many, many hundreds of years later by a male-dominated church system. Snap, snap, snap. <laughs> I can't snap, so I just have to say it. <laughs> but that queendom meant realm of authority and power. The queendom, there is a queendom. There is a realm of authority and power, and you can access it, and it is in heaven, which is the realm of the invisible. So he talked about causation, where you truly can be fed, nurtured, and empowered from, empowered from, is in the realm of the invisible, and you can access that realm of the invisible. Now, this is nothing new. Plato talked about it. Most spiritual masters talk about it. Quantum physics is all about it. Quantum physics has all about the invisible creating the visible and then moving the visible back into the invisible. And it's all done, yay, by the observer. As Ernest Holmes said, eventually the scientists will reach the top of the mountain and the mystics will have put out a uh, picnic uh, blanket and invite them to sit with them. So he, this is not new. This isn't, this isn't something that only he has said, but most mystics and sages have said this. And we lost the power of it when we thought that heaven was a place, I mean, talking culturally here, that heaven was a place that you went to after you died. No, it's a place that you access here and now. When is the kingdom? Here and now. In the Gospel of Thomas, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But if you think it's in the sky, the birds are already there. <laughs> it's here. So that kingdom... That kingdom is where we move into in our own mind to access that realm of what spirit is. Now, how do we do that? I believe that power, I think that power, this is, I think that power is not something we should pursue. Because often when we pursue power, what we're really doing is just becoming forceful. We're, we're just trying to muster up our own power. And yet power is the, power is what happens when you delve into that invisible realm. The invisible realm of causation, you will find power, along with peace, love, and joy, and all that other good stuff. And the way that we move into that invisible realm is through spiritual practice, but it's not just spiritual practice to do spiritual practice, it's spiritual practice for the purpose of seeking first that kingdom so that all else is added. The power, the love, the peace, the encouragement, the, the creativity, and all that stuff that comes because we have been seeking first that kingdom. But we have to seek it. Seeking is the connection. There's a story, a Sufi story, that talks about a man who really wanted God. He yearned for God. He, he wanted God so much and God was never around. He prayed and he never thought that the prayers were answered. He longed and he wanted to be touched and he never thought he was touched. And he, he would reach out and then at night he would cry, Allah! But probably for longer. But I got a talk to do. And finally, this is, I think, an interesting fact. The Sufis, where we like to be, at, you know, enlightened and inspired by angels, the Sufis would send, their, their masters would be sent deer. <laughs> so this light-filled deer met him one evening and said, I heard you crying. Why are you crying? And he said, I'm looking for my connection with the infinite. I, 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 want, I want to be touched by God. I want to know God. I want God to know me. I want, I want to be filled with it. And the deer said, ah, in the longing is the connection. You are connected. You long because it longed for you and you heard its cry. 
So spiritual practice for the purpose of seeking the kingdom is what gives us the benefit, not spiritual practice for the purpose of getting something. See, we can sit in silence and call it meditation and it will reduce uh, blood pressure. We can sit in silence and do meditation and it will help all of our body functions be better. I've read two reports recently where schools are now, uh, two schools now are having their children do meditation instead of having time out someplace. The, the, the detention level has gone way down and the ruckus that children can create out of way too much sugar is going way down. The, everything is more peaceful. So you can meditate for the purpose of being more peaceful. You can meditate for the purpose of being more, more um, healthy, healthier. Or you can do it because you really want to listen to the silence because in the silence is the voice of God. The voice of God speaks in silence and everything else is interpretation. Ernest Holmes said, I look into the darkness until I see the light. I listen to the silence until it speaks. Are we really wanting to connect and have something speak? Do we listen? Do we come still for that reason? Or do we come still so that we don't erupt? Do we pray to say, ah, man. I know there's heaven. I've been told there's heaven. I want to know that heaven now. I want to know its peace, its power, its love, its creativity, its serenity, its security. I want to know that. I want to know that now. I want that now. Or do we pray to get something so that things change so that we can be peaceful? Is that making sense? <sighs> Now, spiritual practice for the purpose of seeking is subversive. It's sneaky and it's stealth. Because as you continue to be still for the purpose of connection, as you continue to pray for the purpose of connection, as you continue to study, and this is one of, uh, this is our book of the month, it's excellent. It's got some great stuff in here. It's by Ernest Holmes. Uh, you Create Your Own Destiny. That sounds powerful, doesn't it? Just some wonder, wonderful stuff. I, I like this book so much that I made it one of the textbooks for our practitioner class. It's excellent. As you continue to do all of those things, all of a sudden you will find yourself different. You will, you'll have no desire to criticize. What? even though you've probably perfected it. <laughs> there just won't be the desire to find fault. There won't be the desire to hold back your truth. There won't be the desire to, uh, to not be who all you can be. You'll find yourself speaking up, sharing your dreams, dreaming big, expressing yourself. Um, you will find yourself less depressed, worried, and suspicious of others. You'll find yourself less, uh, less pointing and blaming and all that other things because it just won't be a part of you because that's not a part of heaven. Another word for heaven is harmony, and you will find yourself in harmony with the world, and it'll be shocking. You'll, you'll shock yourself. Somebody will be in your face, and you'll go, whoa. <laughs> Man. And you'll find yourself praying that they feel more peaceful because obviously something's going on with them to make them so prickly. It, 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 you'll, you'll shock yourself. You'll be in traffic and you get to work and you didn't even hate it. <laughs> you'll find yourself praying for others. I mean, I, I mean like... There are people now that I, I know that I, I know I would have subtly and only in the privacy of my own mind criticized. And I don't I, I just immediately go into prayer that they know their their brilliant self. That they'll know their brilliant self. Now, why is that happening? Jesus the, 
talked about why that happens and how that happens, and he gave it in a parable that I did not understand until I started studying more in, um, in my metaphysical studies. And what I realized is that sometimes people use examples that work now, and so we try to interpret what they were doing 2,000 years ago and saying 2,000 years ago, and, and doing it from our own understanding. And since I'm not a farmer or have an agricultural background, I can't understand some of the things he's talking about. Just like if somebody showed up here and now, they wouldn't understand that if you constantly think about certain things, it's like putting those things on your browser and then it will, the computer just gives it to you anytime. They would go, what? But, so let's go into a little agricultural information, ready? Good. Well, whether you're right or not, I'm doing it. Um, Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven is like unto a mustard seed. How many of you have heard that? Now you've heard about moving the mountain. But first he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And it starts out the smallest of seeds, which is really not, but it's pretty tiny. And it grows into this big bush. And so I thought, well, great. So the kingdom of heaven grows. But I didn't know that at that time, farmers did not like mustard seeds and they certainly would not grow them. And the reason is a mustard seed takes over. A mustard plant takes over. It doesn't just become a bush. It has a root system that is, is you know, goes, it's, it's like conquer, conquer the earth. Take all the nutrients. It's for myself. And so what happens is the mustard seed, the, the mustard bush not only grows large, that the root system will go anywhere in the field and destroy all the other plants because it sucks away all their nutrients. Now, that sounds like a bad thing, doesn't it? Kind of like, oh my goodness, monster plant. But he was making a point. When you entertain, when you seek heaven, heaven starts to grow in you and the other thoughts perish. All that other stuff you've been growing in your consciousness starts to just shrivel up. You're no longer who you used to be. It's, you're different. You're no longer as bothered as you used to be. You're no longer as worried. You're just changed at depth. Hafiz, I'm going to paraphrase his poem because he did it beautifully, but he does a, pro, a, a poem called these, Those Beautiful Hands. He says, uh, my beloved friend whose beautiful hands comes and, and, and s who comes into my room at night and with your beautiful hands you take away all of my blemishes so that I wake up once again innocent and pure. See, there's, uh, we don't have to try to make ourselves better. We just seek and we find ourselves better, including more powerful, able to choose the way we want to be, able to react the way that we would like to react, which is from our highest thought, how many of you at the end of the day go, oh, I really wish I hadn't done that? Um, yeah. Oh, mm. how many, how many, there'll be less of that because it won't be in you. It just sort of dissipates. I, I have a few examples I want to give. Um, the first one is uh, I've, I've had to do a lot of spiritual work because there's a lot of things going on in the world that I was un unhappy with and a lot of things going out in, in my personal world that I was unhappy with. So instead of trying to change it, which would be forceful, I just moved inside and moved inside and, and sought first that kingdom. And I've noticed that A, everything's turning out okay, and B, I'm different. I, I don't, I used to not want to do anything unless it was perfect. I certainly wouldn't show up here unless my hair would look good. I don't like my hair, don't say anything, I don't care, it's all in my head, but I'm still here. 
<laughs> and I'm not wearing a hat. I mean, that might seem slight to you, but how many of you have let yourself be controlled by what's going on? It's, um, I, played, I played the, what is that, the cowbell? I played the cowbell, and it was bad, but it was okay. Well, it was bad because I missed it half the time, and it was, but it's like, who cares? I am expressing my life. I'm just expressing. Harold Costa was brave enough to try something totally new. Totally new. And some of you liked it and some of you didn't. But it really doesn't matter because he was there expressing life. How many of us only do things we think we'll get approval for? That's not powerful living. That is being a human being trying to lay low and not cause any problems. That is not the life abundant. The word that was translated as I've, life, as, as I've come, that you might have life and have it more abundantly, could also be translated as energy, vitality, and um, expression. I, I know the energy and the vitality. I, and some other word that I don't, didn't write down, read too much, don't write down enough. Anyway, but how, how many of you want to show up in your energetic, vital self? But we, like, what would people think? Do you know that your shyness will absolutely fall away if you do your spiritual practice? Because you'll be so excited to see the face of God someplace else. You'll be so excited. Another illustration of that is our wonderful Lori Hawkins. Stand up, Lori. Lori is the, the house manager head honcho. Thank you. And uh, she, she's, she's done amazing things. She created for herself an exit plan from her last company. And then she started looking for new work and found that instead of looking for work like, oh, what do you got? Can I, what do you got? What, what can, what, what do I fit? It's like, no, this is who I am. Who wants to hire me? Do you see the shift? how powerful that is. Now, this wasn't a prayer like, I've got to think that. That's the thought that comes when it is the kingdom of heaven finding a root within your consciousness. And all of a sudden, you start operating out of the highest ideal of yourself instead of the lowest idea of yourself. We start being empowered to shape our world and not always be shaped by it. We'll find that we, we entertain a holy hope. Now, let me tell you about holy hope. Holy hope is the desire of your heart that, that you so are afraid to even entertain because it seems so impossible. And yet hope is always the voice, the sweet, still voice of spirit that we hear when we're silent that tells us of our next greater yet to be. And then we entertain that with our faith. But we will not listen to our hope if we don't know that there's power within us to bring it about. If you have no hope, it's because you have not accessed power. If you have an access power, it's because you have not sought, sought with all of your mind, heart, and being the kingdom of God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, thy God. I don't care, what, whatever you call it, Charlie, Jehovah, Michelle. If you, if you want to seek it with all your mind, heart, and soul, it will seek you back because it's been seeking you forever. And that desire to connect is the, is the power that will be the mustard seed that will change you at depth. And then all you have to do is enjoy the fruits thereof, which is more love, more joy, more power, more creativity, more security, and more ability to not only shift your life, but the world. That's how it works. That's how it works. Now... Um, I just want to make sure that I haven't forgotten anything, so I guess I move on. 
So, the talk title was uh, The Power of Agreement. So, I haven't talked about agreement yet, so now let's talk about agreement, because I've talked about power and what that is, and that power is the result of a deep spiritual practice that is a practice for seeking first that kingdom. That realm, oh, by the way, I told you it was a realm, or, uh, in the Aramaic, if you really break it down, it's not only a realm of power, it's the realm of power that comes from I can. The realm of power that comes from I can. And it starts to show up in us because we seek that presence, that presence of God, that presence of heaven and we want it in us. So how do we go with agreement? Agreement... The first, there's three parts of agreement that I want to talk about very briefly. First agreement is agreeing with God's idea of you instead of what somebody told you sometime. And all major religions say that human beings were created by the infinite as an expression of that infinite in finite form. Therefore, you are the same substance, the same expression as the original, originating creator, which means, let's just, you know, in uh, biblical terms, we'll just call it good. You are created good because you were created from good. Now, some of us don't always believe that, and that's because we believed what some kid said on the playground when we were younger, or what our aunt accidentally said, or we interpreted our parents' actions and they were unskilled. I mean, I, I, I've got, you know, I've gone through therapy. I've, I'm sorry, Mama. I'm going to talk about this. I mean, I went through so much because my mother was distracted. But as a child, I interpreted that, interpreted her distraction as I'm not worthy of love. She had her own issues. I'm no longer the effect of my mother's issues. Because I have got to recognize, and I want to speak this to all of you, you are an expression of the originating creative cause that, that initiated all that you see and all that you will never see. You are a divine idea that was so loved you came to be. Now, we can either be in agreement with that, which has been said by the saints, the mystics, and everyone else that we call a high and holy teacher, we can be in agreement with that, or we can, and, and that means to live from our highest thought, the highest thing that we've ever been told, or we can continue to be in agreement with our, our fears, our doubts, and our prejudices. Because when we do not believe in ourselves and others, we are prejudiced against God. We are always our understanding of God. We either understand God as good and f friendly and for us, or we understand God as some sort of uh, judge in the sky, which is really dumbing it down to Santa Claus. <sighs> so, who wants to be in agreement with God? Great. The other kind of agreement that is powerful is when someone asks you to pray with them, agree with their highest hope. Agree with them. Agree with their highest hope. Because that hope, no matter what's going on in them, is, is the spirit moving them into a greater experience of expression. So agree with it. Because a lot of times, how many, I mean, I don't do it anymore, but I remember in my, my ministerial youth, hearing what somebody wanted, and me evaluating that it was going to be impossible. And I prayed anyway, and then the miracle happened, and it's like, so now I just give that up. Because if I agree, even, even in my expression of prayer, with the highest hope, with those two, I and, and they are now in agreement, and something must happen. And it must be for good. And it must be a great good. I want to tell you, uh, uh, there's so much I want to say about good, but I just got this. Do you mind if I go a tiny bit late? Tiny? Well, I just got this wonderful demonstration for somebody that I pray for. And then she just told me how, you know, the rest of the story. She wanted out of her lease. And uh, so she went to her, 
her landlord and said, can I get out of the lease? And the landlord said, yes, because I think the person that above you that owns the, that rents the floor above you wants to do the whole building. So if they say yes, you can get out of the lease. So the person that above said, yes, we'll take over the whole building. And uh, she got out of her lease. But, what she, but she was always praying, it's good for me, it's good for them, it's good for the landlord, it's good for me, it's good for them, it's good for the landlord, it's got to be good, good, good. If it's good for me, it's got to be good for everybody, it's going to be good for everybody. Well, as it turns out, as soon as she got out of the lease and it was written down, the people up above decided not to rent the lower half. And so, so they, they, in fact, they decided to leave the whole building. But what's really great is that there was no lease encumbering the landlord from selling and making a huge profit, much more than he would have just leasing. Are you willing to be in agreement with the highest good? And here's the last one I want to say. Are you willing to collect people around you that agree that heaven can be, already is, but needs to be recognized and revealed on earth? Are you willing to be in agreement that there can be heaven on earth? Then that is the highest state of consciousness. For a lot of you, you use these principles. Your life's working great. Hallelujah. Half sanghas. Oh, goody. You sit around and you talk about, oh, I want this or I want that and I want to fix this and I want that, that. How about a group of people coming together and saying, you know what? I know that I am accessing my own power. But if we ha put our power together, we can claim for this world the answer to things because in God, there's always a solution and there's always a way to have it work out. But are we griping about current conditions? Or are we willing to will God's will and be used through prayer to create a new reality? See, a lot of times we want to change the world through, through um, shifting conditions. I want to suggest that there's a way to create a better world through letting the kingdom of heaven do the work and move stealth-like and start to kill the ideas that have been running us, running our world. See, we cannot legislate people to love people. We cannot legislate people to care for people. We're never going to legislate people to be uh, non-racist. We're never going to be able to do that. But I'm telling you, there is a power that we have never harnessed. Now, individuals do it. I see miracles happen in individuals' lives. What if a song got together and said, you know what? Collectively, once a month, we are going to know that there's a solution to homelessness. What if collectively we're going to get together and know that there's a solution to the hunger issues of the world because there's one third of the food is thrown away every day? What if we know that there's a circulation process that's emerging in somebody's mind? What if we hold that and you know what? We will be the answer because we're willing to own the answer. Now, Emma Curtis Hopkins says, if you see a job, it's yours. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you do it. It means that you hold it and then others will be called to do it. There's, a, there's you know, supposedly the, we're, we're killing the coral reef and some gentleman figured out a way to grow coral quickly. Another young kid is finding a way to clean up the oceans. Most likely that was the result of people praying, dear God, do something. Are we willing to do that? And then the power of agreement, it becomes so incredibly rich. We, we do individual work. Are we willing to say, I am the place where solutions can be held, nurtured, and made real. That is a powerful agreement. I, I got this idea last week when I, you know, I try not to watch the news, but something happened, and I went, oh, really? Oh, really? And then I thought, no, Kathy Ann, you are way too powerful to believe in this problem. You are way too powerful. How dare you dummy down your spiritual self to the place of human conditions. You rise up 
and you speak the word that a solution is happening now. We will never ever get rid of terrorism by putting terrorists in jail. We will do it by being the place where love is more powerful than hate ever was. We will do it that way. And somehow things change. I've noticed it's changing in my family. I notice it's changing in our world. Are you gonna be the place where the kingdom of heaven is made real? That's, that's the question. That's your opportunity. And so it is.